of the Imperial College uh, London. Uh, his work uh, is about the optimization of a domestic scale solar organic rink and cycle system for uh, CHP provision in the United Kingdom. Thank you. Uh, good morning. <coughs> so, uh, in this talk, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about why we're uh, interested in um, organic ranking cycle as a, a technology for combined heating and power in domestic applications in the United Kingdom. Um, I'm going to describe briefly um, a model uh, that I've produced in order to uh, assess the potential, and um, I'm going to speak about some recent developments. Uh, to um, get an idea of, uh, of what we could achieve. Um, okay. Um, <coughs> so, I, uh, so I think um, the UK is perhaps known for um, it, it's not a uh, fantastic uh, solar resource, um, but uh, in the last decade or so, um, domestic PV and uh, solar hot water systems have proved reasonably successful. Um, and uh, we're interested in, in <laughs> seeing whether uh, um, combined heating and power systems based on organic ranking cycle could be um, in competitive. Um, and, uh, and then looking at the design of these systems and how, the, how this could be optimized for the UK with its um, intermittent and, and fairly low uh, solar <laughs> resource. Um, as an initial uh, comparison, um, we can say if we look at a, a typical domestic uh, rooftop size, um, about 15 meters squared, um, and using some uh, typical <laughs> annual um, electricity demand uh, information, um, if we just consider, um, if we were to fill the roof with uh, monocrystalline uh, PV panels, um, we might expect to produce perhaps 50% of the demand for a typical household in, uh, in a year, presuming that we could use everything that we generate. <coughs> and this would have an associated uh, savings on electricity bills, um, up to perhaps um, 270 uh, euros per year, um, and for an initial uh, complete system cost of perhaps a little bit over 5,000 euros. Or we might choose to have a, um, a solar hot water system. And an example here would be uh, an based on evacuated tube um, uh, solar thermal collectors. It's a typical system size for, um, for a, uh, a household. Um, might be something like a five meter squared system based on a 30 tube collector array for initial cost, including the cylinder and the installation of uh, about four and a half thousand euros. And again, we might hope uh, to cover about 50% of our hot water demand over the year for, um, for the, the typical family. And uh, there would again be some associated savings, um, in this case about 75 euros per year. Um, but we also, but we then have um, about two thirds of our roof still available. And perhaps if we were looking at providing a combination of heat and power, from, uh, from solar energy, we might choose to cover the rest of the roof with PV panels. Um, so this is a then, would then be a smaller PV system than the original one, uh, perhaps a cost of about 4,000 euros as an initial cost, um, and um, might cover about 35% of the electricity demand. So we're perhaps covering about 50% of the uh, uh, hot water demand and 35% of the electricity demand for a total cost of something like uh, 8,500 euros. And then there's a, a total energy bill savings there of um, about two, 250, 260 uh, euros per year. Um, so that was kind of a, an initial exercise there. And then to, to compare this, if we were then to say, well, let's cover the entire rooftop with solar thermal collectors. Uh, we can have hot water, but we can also um, have uh, a system based on organic ranking cycle for generating electricity as well. Providing that this is based on cheap, readily available components, uh, it should be a fairly cheap system to, um, to uh, construct and install. Um, so looking at the cost for the organic ranking cycle plus the additional uh, solar thermal collectors required in the install, 
uh, of an additional uh, 3,000 euros then added to our original uh, 4,500 for the, the solar hot water system. So, um, so we're looking at a, a total cost then of about 1,000 euros capital cost lower than the PV and solar hot water system combination. And although the electrical power output is lower, we've got the potential, depending on how we configure our system, to perhaps generate more hot water and to also generate a <coughs> considerable amount of electricity. And that's, of course, dependent on choosing the best design and also the best type of solar collector for this application and the temperatures involved. So um, that's kind of the starting point. And the initial part of my PhD project was um, forming a model uh, within which we could test the various components, various ideas for design and configuration. And so this is a model that I constructed in MATLAB, is schematic, kind of simply showing it. Um, it uh, essentially contains a number of subcomponents, including the solar collector array, the, uh, the organic ranking cycle, um, and the hot water generator. Um, and this is the initial configuration we used with the hot water generator downstream of the organic ranking cycle, so that the organic ranking cycle kind of gets the, the, the highest potential in terms of the, the hot fluid leaving the collector array. Um, initially, I've considered a, an indirectly heated cycle. So there's two fluid circuits. There's the solar circuit and there's the um, the ORC circuit. Um, in the organic ranking cycle, um, we're looking at initially at R245 FA as the working fluid, although we consider, um, we'll consider other fluids. Um, there's a 15 meter squared solar collector array, which again is going back to that typical domestic rooftop size that I mentioned before. Um, I am using um, solar irradiance and climate data for London to, in order to simulate this, the system over a, an annual period. Um, and also demand profiles for electricity and hot water usage. And initially, because this is an exercise initially to assess the kind of the maximum potential, I'm looking at rejecting heat from the condenser to water, uh, but there will be a comparison with air as well. So um, I think the purpose of this slide is, is, is really to just state in our initial assumptions with regard to this collector. So initially I compared um, uh, an evacuated tube non-concentrating collector, which seems like a reasonable collector to use for the UK with a high diffuse component of solar irradiance, but also compared it to a, a, a small parabolic trough array. Um, uh, and for that, I assumed perfect tracking of the sun for, um, in order that it can receive direct normal irradiance. Um, and then uh, all of the flow rates in the system initially are fixed flow rates, so in the working fluid circuit and in the uh, in the solar collector circuit, and the pressures are set at a fixed um, at a fixed level as well for the, the entire annual simulation. Um, but what we then did was to adjust those fixed flow rates um, to find the maximum power output over the year. And I think initially we found that our, our, we were kind of about uh, 60 to 70 percent of what we um, estimated that we could get up to. So there's there was obviously a lot of, of room to then explore the design and the optimization of the system. Um, um, so the net, the, where I really started was then to, to look at collectors in, in a bit more detail. Um, so initially I was modeling um, the collectors in terms of their, of their manufacturer's efficiency data that's provided. And I just extended this to a, a wider range of collector. I looked at 10 different types of collector. Some were concentrating, some were non-concentrating. Um, they all have different characteristics. Um, and I wanted to, uh, to perform this analysis in a way that was uh, independent of the, uh, of the design of the organic ranking cycle. So um, I, I took some of the, um, some of the principles of uh, exergy analysis in order to do this. So I evaluated the, the maximum work that could be produced by um, the range of collectors over a range of temperatures and that's evaluated as the, the, the maximum work produced by um, an infinite number of infinitesimal Carnot uh, uh, engines operating between the hot stream, which is the fluid leaving the collector, and the cold stream, which is the fluid returning to the collector. Um, again, assuming that the, the collector fluid can be brought down to uh, the, the dead space temperature, which is the temperature of our heat rejection medium. Um, I performed this for a fully reversible and um, an endo-reversible analysis in order to, um, to perhaps with the endo-reversible analysis where I'm assuming that temperatures within the cycle are 
lower and higher than, than that of the source and the sink uh, in order to get a, there's, so there's some uh, irreversibility kind of taken into account there and I want to get a, perhaps a slightly more practically achievable idea of, of what the maximum could be. This is, um, so in terms of the maximum power then, this is showing, um, Uh, yeah, so this shows the, the shape of the, of the, uh, the power output curve as we vary the temperature at which the collector is operating. And there's kind of a peak to this curve, which is where um, the kind of the dominance changes between the, the thermal losses from the collector and uh, due to higher temperatures and the, um, the increased efficiency of the <laughs> cycle due to the, the increase in the, the kind of efficiency. And so it kind of it indicates that there is a, uh, an optimal temperature at which these collectors can perform. And so over the range of collectors, uh, obviously the, the higher temperature, higher output collectors are the, the con for a given con solar irradiance condition are the, uh, the concentrating collectors. But then I evaluated this over a whole year and it's, it's actually <coughs> quite, com with using UK climate data, it's quite, it's fairly comparable between uh, the, the, the typical uh, non-concentrating evacuated tube collectors and the parabolic trough collectors for which I had information. So taking this forward, I mean, on a, and on a basis of cost as well, um, evacuated tube, a lot less, uh, sorry, uh, non-concentrating collectors, a lot less requirements in terms of tracking systems and so on. So that's also something to be taken into account. Um, so the next step really, and this is kind of the main thing to talk about here, is um, uh, I've looked at taking the model now from a fixed flow rate system, which obviously is not ideal, to, um, to a variable flow rate system. And really there, uh, there's also the idea of possibly varying the pressure as well or, um, in the evaporator. So I've performed this as really as an optimization of three variables, which is the working fluid flow rate, the solar collector fluid flow rate, and the evaporation pressure. Um, and we want to, ma want to maximize the power output from, from, the, uh, from the engine. Um, and we're constrained by, this is, at the moment, this is a basic organic Rankine cycle. There's no recuperator, but we are constrained by the pinch points in the cycle um, and the, uh, the fluid that we're, that we're using um, and the, the minimum and maximum pressures that we can operate at. Um, so, um, so just for, for anyone who's interested about the kind of modeling approach, but in order to do this optimization, I've, I basically changed from the or original approach, which was a time marching approach, whereby within any fluid loop, um, the, the outlet temperature from one time step becomes the inlet temperature in the next time step. And what we see with that was um, the, using the UK climate data at a fixed flow rate, there's kind of a, obviously um, an, an on-off switching of the system uh, if, if, if it's not able to sustain the, the temperatures required to, uh, to keep a steady <laughs> power output. Then for uh, moving towards a variable flow rate model, I've changed to a quasi-equilibrium approach for the modeling in, in that that allows me to solve for each time step the temperatures in the, uh, in the system um, and it's a bit easier for the, the optimization process. So um, this is just showing how by varying the organic ranking cycle uh, working fluid flow rate, flow rate so that only the amount of heat that's coming in at the collector is then removed at the evaporator. Um, it can maintain a, a steadier, uh, a steadier uh, power output from the, from the engine um, at a steadier temperature. And then, um, and then this is how I then approached controlling the other two variables, which were the evaporation pressure and the working fluid fr flow rate. So um, I'm basing it on a control of temperatures. So I start with an initial temperature, uh, inlet temperature to the uh, collector. Um, and then using that uh, exergy uh, based assessment of the, the optimum operating temperature, and then choose an outlet temperature which corresponds to a, um, a, a maximum work output. Um, and then this gives me a flow rate as well. So I have um, the profile of the heat source um, I can then, based on some set uh, pinch temperature differences, um, calculate a work uh, power output from the cycle. Um, it gives me a flow uh, up the, um, the evaporation pressure until I hit pinch point there. 
So that gives me a, a maximum power output for that particular set of conditions. And then I, I repeat that new in, in that temperature until I find the maximum, uh, the maximum power output for that initial set of, for that set of conditions. So I perform this using a range of um, solar irradiance conditions so that I've then got a relationship between solar irradiance and optimal temperatures and the associated uh, flow rates and pressures. Um, uh, I, I won't go into this too much, but there obviously there's, this is a contour map of, um, of um, collector temperature in that temperature against uh, uh, solar irradiance and uh, for a maximum power output. And it just kind of shows the, uh, the kind of the, the, um, the optimal plane that I, uh, that I based the relationship on. Um, and when I applied this as a control within the model, um, I achieved a, uh, a far better, a far higher power output over the over the course of the day um, than for the fixed flow rate, flow rate model and the model where I was only adjusting the uh, the working fluid flow rate. Um, and this is a plot of the, the temperatures and the pressure um, and how that. Uh, so we can see the. Um, the pressure there um, increasing with um, solar irradiance. <laughs> now, um, obviously, this, uh, uh, this is uh, yeah, and this is showing the, the flow rates in the system. So the working fluid flow rate increases again with this, uh, sort of follows the irradiance pattern over the day. The uh, collector flow rate uh, is highest actually at low irradiance in order to uh, keep the temperature, uh, leaving the collector low because uh, at the higher temperatures, when the irradiance is lower, there's the uh, higher associated thermal losses. Um, and then yeah, this is a TS plot over the course of the day as, as solar irradiance increases, how shows how the, 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 um, the cycle kind of modulates. But obviously, this is assuming some kind of uh, ideal control. And there's obviously, um, it's for that to be put into a real control strategy that will involve some limitations due to cost and practicality. Um, but I think we have demonstrated that, um, that this is just one way that we can uh, work towards assessing what the maximum power output from the, uh, from the uh, system operating, from a, such a system operating in the UK could be. And then there are several other, other uh, design features that we could look at. Um, and uh, just one thing that I didn't mention is that we are kind of getting towards about 70% uh, of that kind of uh, that upper limit, the, the, uh, the upper uh, maximum power uh, output that for this particular type of collector that we looked at, which is an evacuated tube. Um, so yeah, there is still room for improving that further. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Um, in view of time, I propose that any question be asked after the session. <laughs> um.